speaking of journeys, uh, mm. we were talking before the show about some different theological journeys you've been on. And mm. one of the questions mm. that, I mean, in the nature of what I do, most of the questions I get have to do with sexuality, gender, LGBTQ related questions. Yes. Yes. I would say yeah. a, a, a thank you. By the way, thank you for the work that you've invested in those sure, questions. Man. Yeah. Thank Seriously, you. It's been helpful Good. to so many people. Good. Thank you. That's yeah. coming from you. That means a ton, man. Um, one of the questions that I haven't, and, and, I've, and I've kind of thought out loud about this on my podcast, mm. and mm. Mm. A, a lot of my audience, I think, is, is trying to figure this out too. It, it really does have to do with like w- women. Mm. leadership positions in church, mm. women's ordination, mm. women teaching, however you want to word it. I, I don't like mm-hmm. women in ministry because ministry is a broad mm-hmm. word that, of mm-hmm. course, women should be in ministry. Um, the question, mm-hmm. women, does the Bible, you know, allow, encourage yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. women in leadership positions? And, and we're talking earlier how you've, you've shifted on that where you were mm-hmm. on a more complementarian mm-hmm. that only may, men should be in leadership positions in the church. But more recently, out of studying the Bible, you switched your view. Can, can you unpack that a bit for? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it has gone in steps. Um, and, you know, I've only once for about five years been in a position where I could speak into that issue in a local church. So I was here in Portland, the Door of Hope Church. I served as a pastor for about five years. So, you know, that was my, I had five years in an environment where it wasn't just about figuring out theologically and biblically how it works, but actually mm-hmm. what does this look like practically? Um, so those have been two really different important learning environments for, for me. Um, but I've always, I, I seriously, I remember reading Bible for the first, reading Paul's letters for the first time. It's still like a memory that I have. And uh, um, there were so many puzzling things in there, but definitely First Corinthians 14 and 11, um, these are some of the classic passages where Paul says comments about some women in these churches and what they were doing. And I was just like, whoa, that's really interesting. Like that, that doesn't fit. Hmm. Um, well, let me say it this way. I was introduced to the Bible through Jesus. Um, I didn't care about the Bible. Jesus became beautiful and compelling to me. And so I just, I just really read the gospels a lot and didn't, that was the first, my first entryway into the Bible. And so that was, I remember from the very beginning, just thinking like, hmm, the, the thing that Jesus was doing with these kingdom of God communities, and then what I see Paul carrying that on, but then there's just these handful of passages. Corinthians, there's a couple, letter to Timothy, there's a couple. And how do they fit? Um, because the way that I see people appealing to those texts in Paul and the, the things that they're building out of those, it, it was a disconnect. Um, so before I even had language for it, I've always tried to understand like, what's going on here. It was always the disconnect for me. Um, so anyway, yeah, where, where I'm at now, um, and I, I'm not happy with the terms of the debate, but in terms of, I'll try and summarize it quickly because I'm bad at being concise. I heard it. So, <laughs> that. so um, I think what we see in the New Testament, what we see in Paul's letters is an urban missionary who is trying to uh, steward the announcement of good news about King Jesus, that through his death, life, death, and resurrection, a whole new future open to humanity, and through the Spirit, the life and love of Jesus can remake us individually and corporately together. Um, and Paul's gospel of freedom, right? Not slavery to idolatry or to certain interpretations of the Torah anymore. And if you look at what Paul, like the people that he mentioned in, in his letters, who he talks about as his co-workers, he mentions men and women, like all over the place as his co-workers. Um, and, you know, in, in the first century, t- to have women in the roles that Paul puts them in, where he, that in his, like, in his greetings, you know, when he talks about Aquila and Priscilla, yeah. or Phoebe, or Junia. I know there's some debate on Junia, but there shouldn't be. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, it's really remarkable. Like, the on-the-ground uh, communities that he describes and that we see at work in the Book of Acts are communities where women are being given a social mobility and a status and honor 
-hmm. in those communities that was unknown in mm -hmm. the first century. There was no parallel um, to it. And so this is for sure why, one of the many reasons, Larry Hurtado and Rodney Stark, historians of early Christianity, tell us that this was one of the main reasons yeah. Christianity grew. Yeah. So all that stuff started to sink in. And then all of a sudden I was able to come back to 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul um, is telling certain um, women, I mean, these are really complicated passages about head covering and yeah. so on. Um, in 14, 1 Corinthians 14, about evaluating prophecy. Um, and the more I've read and studied those texts, the more I see Paul um, using contextual strategies so that the witness of the gospel isn't compromised um, by people abusing this new freedom of these, uh, that men and women have in, the, in these communities. Um, I think that almost every time you see Paul hedging in a particular church community, and there's not that many, there's Corinth and there's Ephesus, basically, mm -hmm. um, is are precisely contexts where new Christian women would be most likely to uh, overuse their new freedom found in the early Christian communities. Mm -hmm. And then that's precisely that's precisely what you see. I'm not being concise, am I? Okay, so let me, <laughs> let's let's go to uh, and we don't need to get nitty gritty, but uh, the yeah. First Timothy two. I mean, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Line. That's right. Yep, that's uh, right. And I know there's a massive debate about when he says, "I do not permit women to teach or exercise authority." That's right. Yep. In particular, and and again, I haven't done a lot of study on it, but mm -hmm. the exercising authority, off or whatever, it's a really unique word, and a lot of debate of whether mm -hmm. he. It's, it's an intrinsically negative kind of authority, which mm -hmm. would rule out all types of authority or whether he is ruling out all types of authority. Yeah, um, yeah. That's and then right. you have him appealing to the creation account. It's just, it's kind of a messy passage. I'm, yeah. I remember looking at the bibliography of a commentary a few weeks oh. ago, actually. And I'm like, I, I just want to give up. I'll just focus yeah. on easy, like LGBTQ questions. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's like, I don't have time to read literally like 25 books written just on this verse. Yes. And hundreds of articles, all well, with good sure. arguments, you know. But. So the, the problem is, you know, that one paragraph attracts all the attention. To me, it was most helpful was starting to read people who were talking about the communication strategy and the themes of that letter as a whole. From the f opening paragraph to the final paragraph, He's, that letter is putting out a whole bunch of fires in Ephesus. Okay. Specifically, for opening lines, caused by false teachers who were deceiving um, people in the community, especially by their interpretations of the Torah. He says it in the opening paragraph <clears throat> that, yeah. that uh, geneal to myths and genealogies sure. connected to the Torah are at the root of the false teachers and what they're doing. And then in more than one place throughout the letter, he makes clear that the false teachers are targeting wealthy, influential women in the community, and some of whom are widowed. With that whole thing about the widows and like wealthy widows who have means to take care of themselves and that whole thing, it's all connected. And so um, in my mind, the most compelling explanation is that Paul's putting the kibosh on a group of influential elite wealthy women who treat the Sunday gathering as a fashion show and have grabbed the mic and are, but they're not theologically trained yet and so he just says dude get like start over <laughs> those right the ladies don't teach let them gain a theological education let's do this whole thing over again so when he says women i do not uh, uh, allow mm -hmm. women to teach exercise authority he is thinking specifically of a spe well specific kind of woman in the church at ephesus in that particular cultural context like yeah that's right kinds of that's women right. i don't allow that's right and i actually think that makes the most sense of his appeal to the genesis 3 story as well yeah that one always throws me off yeah um because eve when he says and talks about you know it was the woman deceived and not the man many people take him to be deriving a universal principle from that yeah. So somehow women are more susceptible to being deceived. Um, but Paul talks about Eve, Eve's deception and temptation in his uh, second letter to the Corinthians. And he, ta he tells the whole church of Corinth not to be deceived like Eve. So for Paul, the Eve deception story, uh, he can use it to describe all kinds of different people, <laughs> um, not just women. 
Does that make sense? In other words, so, he, so he's not he's not appealing to to Eve as a symbol of femalehood, like what what Eve that's right. did. Right. That's right. Is based on her femaleness, and therefore all females are more prone to deception. Yeah, that's right. You're saying he's just using that as a, as just an example. It's an example of um, how there's a, there's actually there's that little glitch in the Genesis three narrative. And Jewish interpreters from a long time ago have picked up on this, where it's the, in, it's the Adam, the male human, given the divine instruction in Genesis 2. But then in chapter 3, the woman just, she knows about it, but we're not told how she knows about it. We're not told of the conversation. Hmm. And then um, it's precisely, she misquotes the divine command. You know, she right, says, right. God, she'll don't eat of it and don't touch it. Yeah. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of really interesting other things going on there. And then that's what the snake capitalizes on is now it all becomes these series of little misquotations. And so what Paul highlights um, is, precise, is precisely that breakdown of passing along the divine instruction, which creates a, a perfect parallel with these women. Hmm. They haven't oh. been properly instructed. And so what they need to do is take a time out and... A get a, get an education and they shouldn't be the ones teaching the community hmm. right now That's so i actually think it makes better sense of his um comment ben witherington has a, a commentary on the pastoral epistles yeah and uh, he works really carefully through that text wades through the massive bibliography okay. and he's not the only one who says that but he he kind of brings together that people who advocate that reading of the passage and it just and he does it in the context of the whole book holy cow Anyway, there you go. I was going to ask you for, for, for uh, people, voices, writers, speakers. And yes. Everybody. You know, and the other most significant contributor to this um, is a scholar, Cynthia Westfall Long, um, yeah. who's written a book called Paul and Gender. Yeah. It's fat, and it's systematic through his, all his letters. And, but it, he's develop, she's developing... A, a Paul's theology of male and female yeah. stink profile and their relationship is yeah. brilliant. Yeah. It's so brilliant. And to be honest, that's what kind of compelled me to finally okay. um, embrace the, again, what category, um, why I don't like egalitarian as a title is because that equality in our cultural setting can be heard by people. Yeah as erasing gender difference. And yes. to me, that's exactly, that's precisely the opposite of what the whole thing is about. The whole point is that Genesis 1, it's male and female, one humanity consisting of two gendered others, and that otherness in unity is the image of God. And so it's precisely the difference of gender that when it's brought together in the unity of the spirit of Jesus to reflect, um, the wisdom and love of God and teaching and instruction and what it means to be human as a community of Jesus together. It's in the gender difference that the, that the beauty of the thing is shown. And so, uh, you know, some people use the term mutualism, <laughs> mutualism. I, I kind of like that, but whatever. I, I, yeah. I think Paul, um, when we watch him saying his comments that we often misread as misogynistic is Paul putting out fires mm -hmm. Um, and if you look at the people he names, at the, the way he talks about power and leadership and authority, um, the, the, the leadership communities were as mutualist as their cultural setting allowed to be effective. Um, but he cared mostly about the effective witness of the gospel. And so, like you see him in Titus, he's really concerned about the behavior of the women mm -hmm. there, and also of older men who drink too much. <laughs> because... <laughs> It's their behavior is going to make the Christian communities look repulsive, even to their pagan neighbors. Right, right. And so that's what he cares about is, so anyway, I explored the, some of this in the videos about Paul in, in the Bible Project, but okay. yeah. anyway, there you go. I, I could go on a lot longer. You could too, obviously, but. Tim, this is super helpful. My audience, I think, is going to appreciate this. So th yeah, Great. thanks for your honesty. I love yeah, getting people as they're kind of fresh and the, the cement is still a little bit wet mm -hmm. as we're exploring and 
yeah. the one thing I just love is to see people wrestle with scripture and, and see yes. Yes. where's scripture taking me. And I'm not, I'm, I'm going to work hard not to project where I want scripture to go onto the scripture. Totally. But yeah, let scripture critique my presuppositions. Yeah, that's right. And it's the most difficult thing to do. It I is. think that's why, that's why, you know, anything I say now, I'm, I'm always hesitant to say anything now because it's like, well, this is where I'm at. Yeah. But there's so many things where I just have had five more years to reflect on Genesis, whatever. And now I can feel I have more clarity. Um, Tim Keller has a saying, you're always stupid now. <laughs> like instead, of, you know, when you look back at yourself a year ago, yeah. and like, Man, I, was, I didn't so get it. So stupid then. back then. Oh, and there's like, just start telling yourself, I'm stupid now. And then uh, at least it makes you humble in the moment. My wife and I often talk about, uh, you know, how we, we look at like our older generation, how they did things and like, man, how come they weren't more teachable and like yeah. understanding and, and, you know, uh, so authoritative top down or whatever. And like, you know, but we often would say, well, okay, in 40 years, what are going to be our, yeah, totally. our kids are going to be like, how could you think that way? How could you think that this yeah. was the right way to do things? And yeah, that's so, right. I think just yeah. having an ongoing posture of humility, I mean, is, is the key. Yeah, so it's all we can do. Well, Tim, love, love, love what you're doing for the kingdom. Um, again, I'm, I'm a, I don't think I've actually explained too much about the Bible Project, but where, I mean, I'm assuming oh. most of my audience, 90% yes. that will know about it. Sure. Well, where can they find the Bible Project just in case they don't know what it is? Yep. How can they learn more about you? Yeah, I got it. Um, yeah, just uh, you can Google the Bible Project or just the Bible Project.com is our website. Okay. Go to YouTube and search Bible, just Bible Project. Go to, go to your computer, go to the interweb. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, to our, our short description we're a nonprofit, crowdfunded animation studio. Okay. Short films about all the books of the Bible, the literary theme, design, and themes yeah. that run throughout the Bible. Cool. And we believe the Bible is one unified story that leads to Jesus Love it. that should be offered free to the world so that everyone can see that for themselves. Highly, highly encourage my audience to go check that out if you haven't done so. And if you haven't done so in the last six months or a year, I mean, you, mm. you guys are really cranking out a lot of videos in the last year, especially. So mm -hmm. go visit Bible Project. And mm -hmm. I, I just, I've taken my kids through a lot of the videos. So like from my, oh, sweet. Yeah, oh my yeah. gosh, from like, for me as a 42 year old mm. Bible scholar, Mm. professor i'm like oh my gosh that, that's what mm -hmm. with psalms and my nine-year-old mm -hmm. is like oh so that's what so you know yeah it's, totally totally it's so brilliant <laughs> like it's it's like a kids can understand it and yet bible yeah. college professors can be yeah, discouraged yeah. by watching it because we're like crap i can't match that so yeah um, it's, yeah you know it's, it's funny we <laughs> fr we have never sat down in any video and thought about kids as oh. a, and uh, but i think it's just the visual medium yeah and the commitment John had, and that I have full, full on adopted, is just to simplicity and communication. Yes. It's not simplistic, no. but simplicity and communication can really bridge a yeah. wide audience. Oh, it's so good. It's and so um, good. it's so funny, we'll, we'll get into a video project. That just happened with uh, oh, a video we were working on, and we thought we were clear with, with draft three of the script. <laughs> yeah. And then all of a sudden, some, some artists point out some things where like, oh, that's not clear at all. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> we thought that was clear. So it's hard to be clear, isn't oh, it? Yeah. Oh, it's you, super you know this. Oh. Yeah. You're, Preston, Preston, you're a good writer. You're like a good communicator to Thanks, a broad audience. And it's an enormous amount of work. Oh, it's so hard. It's so yeah. hard. Well, yeah. thanks so much, Tim. And yeah, I yeah. hope lots of people go to your website and YouTube channel as a result of this uh, talk. Yeah, so, Preston. Cheers. Thanks so much. You've been listening to Theology in the Raw. 